Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. I'm going to say that again only because I to hear voices coming back <laughs> is so amazing after I haven't been in this space in over two years. So Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat. That's the way it's done amazing. in Portland, Oregon. Amazing. <laughs> Um, we're going to start tonight with a nigun that then we'll sing Hine Mato, Psalm 133, how good, how beautiful and pleasant it is for all of us to be together. Those words are found on page 10, but I'm going to teach you this little tune that was attributed to uh, Rabbi Nachman of Bretzlov, so of Bardichev, sorry, Rabbi Nachman of Bardichev. And because we are going to be hearing about Rabbi's story from Poland and Ukraine, um, I thought it was nice to sing a little something that was heard by the, the man who wrote down this melody, heard it in 1935 uh, in the Stiebel there. So let's, uh, we'll sing it together first on la 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 or die 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 or whatever is your syllable that you that you love. Yeah, I lie, 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 lie. Yeah, I lie, 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 lie. Yeah, I lie, 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 lie. it is, how pleasant it is when we can come together, be together in peace. It's good to enter into Shabbat together, to not just be able to say hello together, but to sing together, to breathe together. It's been quite a week. A hard one for us. We know this week started with an anti-Semitic attack on our congregation. We know that there have been other events that have happened, perhaps coincidentally, against the Muslim Community Center in Portland, against the East Side Jewish Commons, perhaps the same perpetrator in both of those attacks. But we know that hate crimes are reality, even in our lovely and beautiful community. And it's been a hard week nationally, as we've heard this reports from the Supreme Court. It's hard to hold confidence and idealism and hopefulness. But we are a hopeful people. We are people who believe in going forward and in changing the world and never giving up, never believing 
that the world is stacked against us, never believing that we can't make things better. And it should, all of these things should energize us and give us hope and give us promise. You being here in this space after knowing that there are those who want to make us not comfortable in our space is meaningful. How beautiful it's been that friends have overwhelmingly given messages, religious leaders, political leaders from all over the area have reached out to us during this time. And that gives us hope and confidence. I want to, everybody here is important and a part of this community. I want to give a special welcome to Eric Ward of the Western State Center, who's joined us today as a sign of support to our community and just came back from Israel. Just got off the plane from Israel, my goodness, uh, and is bringing a little bit of the Holy Land with us and was able to celebrate Yom Atzmut, Israel's Independence Day in Israel with a group of uh, other religious leaders uh, and those who are working to build a better world. Israel as a promise for people who were left wandering for thousands of years, told we didn't matter, told that we should leave where places that we called home. And we have a home and we have strength wherever we are. That is also a part of us as well. There is hope, there is hopefulness, and there is promise. So we are coming into this space today, back into our chapel, back close, even though we know that there's still COVIDs out there and all those kinds of things, but we are holding on to hopefulness, promise, meaning, building together a better world. May we continue on that path. May we continue to build together a world of peace. We welcome all who are here and all who are watching our service online. We appreciate you gathering with us too. Our community is richer by all the different ways that we are coming together. Let's make sure that everyone here is welcome. Please turn to someone around you, wish them a Shabbat Shalom, welcome them to our service. We're going to turn back in our prayer books to page two. Pleasure to welcome Debbie Bramer to bring the lights of Shabbat into our community. Yeah. Turn to page six. We'll invite you to please rise five. for Kiddush. Page five. We'll invite you to please rise for Kiddush. Baruch Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Oh. 
Turn to page 20, Lechadodi Likrat Kala. Come together, we will welcome the bride of Shabbat to our community. God, from whom the evening flows, your wisdom sets the way in which time and season glide. Your breath guides the sail of the stars, creator of the tide of time and light. You guide the current of day and infinite. Heaven spans to infinity. You set its course for eternity. 
praise to you, Adonai, our God, in whom the ages are fulfilled. <laughs> want us to really take into our hearts what we're actually saying, and I'd like us to read together on page 37 this interpretation of the Ahafta. Let's read together. Love, Love your God, God with, with every, every heartbeat, heartbeat, with every breath, with every, every conscious act. act. Keep, Keep in mind the words I command you today. Teach, teach them to your children. children. Talk about, about them at work, work. Whether, whether you are tired or you are rested. Let, Let them guide, guide the work of your hands. Keep, keep them in the forefront of your vision. Do not leave them in the doorway of your house or outside your gate. They are reminders to do all of my mitzvot so that you can be holy for God. I am Adonai, your God, who led you out of Egypt to become your God. I am Adonai, your God. Adonai, Page 41, sing the song of men and women joined in understanding and respect, the song of God's miracles, an earth protected and cherished, a gift for our children and the generations to come, the song of a land once ravished by war, now quiet and content, our soldiers home to leave no more, the song of a world redeemed, a song of peace. Mi hamo chaba li madonai, mi kamo chane dar vakodesh no hamta no ra, no ra tehi lot ose pene. Mi hamo chaba li madonai. Mi kamo chane dar vakodesh no ra, no ra, no ra tehi lot. Oh, say, Fanny. Forty-two. Grant, O God, that we lie down in peace and raise us up, our guardian, to life renewed. We search for that sukkat shalomecha wherever we are, whether it's in our homes, whether it's in our worship spaces. We pray to be protected and to feel embraced and sheltered in that under that tent of peace. So that's what we're going to sing, the third line of the Hashkivenu, 
in either the Hebrew there on page 42 or in the transliteration, Ufro Salenu Sukkat Shalomecha. Ufro Salenu Sukkat Adonai, guardian of Israel, whose shelter of peace is spread over us, over all your people Israel, and over Yerushalayim, and over Jerusalem. Amen. Page 46, we rise for Tehillim. name is holy and those who are holy praise you every day blessed are you adonai the holy god please be seated page 55 let's read together may these hours of rest and renewal open our hearts to joy and our minds to truth 
May all who struggle find rest on this day. May all who suffer find solace. May all who hurt find healing on this day. May all who despair find purpose. May all who hunger find fulfillment on this day. And may this day fulfill its promise. Baruch Ata Adonai, Mekadesh HaShabbat. Praise to you, Adonai, who sanctifies Shabbat. Amen. Rabbi Nachman of Bratzlaff wrote a prayer for peace from Bratzlaff in Ukraine. May it be your will, Holy One, our God and God of our ancestors, that you erase war and blood, bloodshed from the world, and that in its place create a great and glorious peace, so that nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. But justice come in waves like waters and righteousness flow like a river, where the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Holy One as the waters in the sea. Shalom Rav, page 60, a prayer for peace. Shalom Rav, Adonai, we bless your people Israel and all of the world. We pray with peace. And we say, let's take a moment of quiet remembrance, quiet reflection, quiet ability to look within our hearts and pray that we can be counted among those who help to bring peace to the world. Oh, say shalom,
us, for all the people Israel and all who inhabit the earth. And we say, Amen. Amen. We had a prayer for those in our community who are ill. We're in need of prayers in this moment. If there's someone in your life who could use a prayer for strength of body, for mind, for spirit, if you'd like to share their name with us, please do so now. recognizing the days that move us from Passover to Shavuot, the time when our ancestors brought first harvests to the temple. A reminder to us as we enumerate each one of these days that it is less important to count the days than to make sure our days count. As we come into this period of time, I'll invite you to please rise as we count the Omer. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haram asher kibesanu b'mitzvotah v'tivanu 
Commanding us to count the angels. Today is 21 days, which is three weeks of the end. And by the way, there is an app. So if that interests you, it's right here. It's a free app, in fact. You're welcome to count the Omer every day. We remain standing as we turn to page 282 for our first reading. And the birthday that shall be won. Loved ones, those whom our friends and neighbors have lost, martyrs, loved people whose graves are unmarked, and those of every race and nation whose lives have been a blessing to humanity. As we remember them, we meditate on the meaning of love and loss, of life and of death. We honor the memories of those in our community who have recently died. Mikhail Penikov, Susie Desmond, Dan Horwitz, Jean Layton, and Elizabeth Olson. And we honor the memories of those whose yurtzeit, the anniversary of their passing, occurs during this time. Melvin Alifans, Ruth Besser, Goodman Bettman, Jerome Blattner, Sylvia Brickman, Jean V. Cohen, Rose Davis, Jay Delman, Betty Miriam Edelman, Clarice Eder, Dr. Howard Englander, Lori Enzer Sohn, E. Ike Eschigan, Howard Gaffin, Zanley F. Galton Sr., Albert H. Gantz, Paul Georges, Maurice O. Georges, Thomas T. Georges Jr., Robert Gilbert, Murray Goldberg, Samuel Goldhire, Joseph Hassan, Susan Hayden, Marjorie Heller, Kevin Andrew Hornstein, Roberta Hunt, Albert George Cantor, William Katz, Rachel Cohen, Sophie Cohen, Elliot Cohn, Stanley Kramer, Jacob Lauderstein, Mitzi Layton, Jack Lazarus, Bernard M. Lieb, Louise Lefitz, Ken Lefkowitz, Charles Levine, Dina Lynn, Beverly Lipman, Ira J. Lipson, Bessie Little, Jesse Ludwig, Janet Lee Maley, Rivka Mendelssohn, Anna Metz, Paul R. Meyer, Myrna Michaels, Thomas John Nelson, Arden New, Edward P. Noodleman, Sophie Marie Olshan, Howard Overback, Lucy Sue Overback, Max Planer, Diana Harrison Rosenfield, Alan Rubin, Jerome Rubinstein, Helen Schnitzer, Lois Shane, Jim Spitzer, Rudy Spring, Leonard Stein, Stanley I. Steinberg, Louise Stumford, Sharon Tarlow, 
Hua Wilner, Milton Waldinger. If anyone else is honoring a yort site and you'd like to share their name, please do so now. We turn to page 294 and rise. Together we say the words of Kaddish. It gadal beit gadash me raba, bel ma di brach irute biam lich mal pute, the chaye hon of yomechon, the chaye de hol beit Israel, the agalau vis man kari vimru amen, yehesh me raba me vorach le lam, the male maya, ye parach vis tabach vit paar vit romam vit nasse. Vita dar vita levi talal shemein kusha brichu le ela min kol birchata veshirata tush bechata venechamata ta amiran de alma vimru amen yehi shlam arab amin shmaya vechayim alenu vel kol Yisrael vimru amen ose shalom vimamav uya se shalom alenu vel kol Yisrael. In Ru, Amen. May the one who creates harmony on high bring peace to us, to all the people of Israel, and to all of the world. And we say, Amen. Amen. Please be seated. We have a lovely bat mitzvah tomorrow morning. Uh, just to let you know about Esther Harrison, who will be uh, coming into the sanctuary uh, as a bat mitzvah. She was a little bit ill, so she's home resting with her family tonight for the Shabbat, but we wish her and all of her family a Mazal Tov. We um, also have tomorrow morning Torah study at nine that's online, the link's on our website. And for any of you that know any littles in your lives and would like to bring them here, we have a Tat Shabbat at nine o'clock that will start in here, in here with me. I'll be here. <laughs> there you go. And, <laughs> And we also have uh, coming up Mitzvah Day on Sunday, May 22nd. I think it's still not too late to sign up for Mitzvah Day. It's always an amazing outpouring of our community. And um, Thursday, May 26th is our annual meeting. So there's a lot for us to celebrate and come together as community. And before many of those things, um, because I know everyone here is interested in the situation in Ukraine, and we're gonna be talking about that in a few minutes. I'll explain that. But on the 17th, um, which is Tuesday, we are going to be hosting a program for the entire community in collaboration with Ecumenical Ministries of Oregon and a number of Ukrainian churches in town, uh, a uh, celebration and commemoration, uh, particularly uh, focused on Ukrainian refugees coming to Portland and the ways that we can be a welcoming community and support of the Ukrainian community that is right here uh, in Portland and and will be growing. So we'll be hearing some Ukrainian music. Um, there is, it happens, uh, there's some wonderful klezmer music that we'll have. Um, there is a, among the recent refugees into our community is uh, someone who I'm told is a very famous Ukrainian folk singer and she will be um, sharing some of her music with us. So um, we're gonna have some information coming out about that on Monday. Um, watch our, our email blast. I believe there's gonna be some advanced registration for that, but I know you'll want to be a part of that uh, really wonderful experience. Um, let me say uh, a, a word about uh, what's happening now. Um, and before, you can go sit down if you'd like to. Um, and I, I, I also, uh, before I do, I also want to, since we were doing some welcomes, I want to welcome a, a, a dear uh, childhood friend, Louis Wilkenfeld, uh, who is visiting. Louis knew me, we got to know each other uh, when we were theater kids together at a teen theater group at the Jewish Community Center in Houston, Texas, of all places. Uh, and he knew me when I was an adamant denier that I would ever be a rabbi, anything but uh, a rabbi. And uh, as he likes to tell the story, uh, I called and told him and some other friends that I had actually made the decision to go to rabbinic school. And he said, what took you so long? It's like, we all knew you were gonna do that. It's like, nobody believed you when you said that. So here's one who's known me long enough to know that. Um, thank you for being with us, Louis. Uh, we're going to take a little bit of a break while we reset things. Um, if you would like to go out and 
uh, have a mozi, get something to eat really quickly, but come back. We're going to be maybe three minutes. Uh, and I'll be sharing with you uh, some pictures and some stories from my experience in, in Poland as we were working with uh, Ukrainian refugees coming into Krakow. So we'll do that. We're just going to take a little bit of a break. Those of you who are watching online, just please stay. You don't need to re-log in or anything else. Um, we're going to uh, have you included in the presentation. Okay, we're Jews here. He said three minutes. So let me say two minutes, <laughs> just because, and let's say a mozi, and then we'll go out so you can get set up. Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Amotzi Lechem Min Ha'aretz all right. Help yourself. We will reconvene shortly. A Jewish two minutes. <laughs> well, pulling is easier than pushing. Oh, actually worked. <laughs> gonna have it. Let me check. Huh? You really did not want the light. Can I move it out of the? I mean, I could move it back a little bit. Is it? In, is it sort of interfering in the shot? Okay. Okay. Oh, what happened to them? Thank you. 
All right, friends, let's uh, let's gather together because I don't want it to be a late night for anyone. And uh, thank you for those who are watching and being patient. I hope you got your challah as well. Uh, we're a bit uh, fortified and, and together here. Um, so the mission that I was privileged to be a part of was called Hineni. Here, I, here we are, here I am. The answer that was given often in the Torah when God called, when God called to Abraham, the answer was Hineni, I'm here. So a group of rabbis and cantors from the United States and Israel gathered together in the place where Jews gather when it's time to figure out a course of action on Facebook. Oh, well, it actually turned out to nothing more than that. We have a, a, a group on Facebook with a, a number of rabbis from the Central Conference of American Rabbis, a reform movement, which is connected to reform rabbis around the world. And one of our colleagues said, we, we, it, we can't be here. We can't be sitting and waiting when we're seeing the suffering that's happening in Ukraine. And those of us who were able and recognized there was privilege in those who had the time and the resources to be able to commit to doing this trip, made that commitment to be able to join together. And with a group of uh, of, of other leaders in our, uh, in our reform movements uh, and our travel group, a brand new travel group actually, J Squared, uh, that is uh, going to be leading us on trips to Israel and other trips sometime in the future, put this together. I sent out, as my colleagues did, sent out messages to the congregation, letting them know that we were taking this trip and that we were planning to bring resources. We were all assigned certain things to gather from our community and uh, ask if we could bring. So this letter many of you received, we sent it out on social media on March 25th. Um, the message went out uh, with this request for uh, funds to support the refugees who were streaming across the border from Ukraine into Poland. And as I think we know from the reporting, the refugees who are arriving in Poland are primarily women and children, and most often uh, mothers with pretty young children. The husbands are not allowed to leave. Uh, men between 18 and the age has changed a little bit, but I think it was 65 at the time. Um, were not allowed to leave, um, whether they were in the army or not, but they could be called in defense. And many of these young women had to leave their husbands, had to leave their elderly parents who couldn't make the trip, had to make a decision to pack a bag in a day, not knowing if they were packing a bag for a day or for the rest of their lives. What does it mean to be a refugee? What does it mean to have to take things and not know what you're packing, not know what you have to bring? We were called on to bring baby food. And how heartbreaking for me to think that I have to schlep baby food to Poland for these young women who are bringing their children and didn't know if they didn't pack enough food to be able to take for their children. We put out the call for funds, for baby food, for antiseptic wipes. I committed myself to bringing five bags of supplies, which I thought was crazy. I didn't know if I was going to have to go buy all that stuff. Um, I didn't know how I was going to carry all of that stuff. But I said, if I'm going to do this, 
we're going to do this. We put out the call and our office upstairs, this is what our office looked like. Um, and Chelsea will attest because she was knee deep in baby food and antiseptic wipes for several weeks. So here, um, about a week later, uh, was some of the supplies that we received. Uh, we sent out ongoing messages that we had raised uh, this on March 30th. We'd raised $22,000 in only a few days to be given. We created a fund just for this purpose, to support refugees from Ukraine. It was, we, we, we did this all very, very quickly. Um, we wanted to be back before Passover because rabbis and cantors had these both familial and congregational responsibilities, but we wanted to be there, but we wanted to be there as quickly as we could. So we were amazed as we sat there just a few days after, uh, after starting this whole thing that we had raised $22,000, I couldn't believe it. By the time I got to Krakow, I presented the executive director of the Jewish Community Center of Krakow with a check for over $60,000 that was raised from this community in about two weeks time. And the supplies that we did filled my car. I got my five duffel bags packed to the brim. In fact, one of our congregants donated the five duffel bags so that we didn't even have to use any of our funds for that. And um, I should also say that um, with a little bit of finagling on the part of this amazing staff, uh, not only Chelsea, but all the rest of our staff, we managed to convince Lufthansa and Alaska Airlines, even more so, uh, to waive the excess baggage fees. So we were not charged to carry any of those bags. And they checked us in from Portland to Krakow. So I didn't have to schlep the bags from one place to another. I did get to schlep, however, my son David. When we were planning this and uh, we were doing this, and I know a lot of people were concerned about what does it mean to be going not to a war zone, but close to a war zone, wanted to make sure my family was comfortable with all of this. Um, so I told my kids on a Zoom call and my son David, who's living in Ann Arbor said, oh, I'd go. I said, well, it's a bunch of rabbis. You don't believe me. You don't wanna be hanging out with a bunch of rabbis. Uh, the cantors, that's fun, but the rabbis, I don't know. Um, but he kind of got into my head and I thought about the fact that David, many of you, many of you know him, you might not have seen him in a few years. He's living in Ann Arbor. David has been working um, for a long time in Portland and in Ann Arbor in homeless uh, services, direct services, helping the homeless here in our community and in the community where he lives. And I thought, you know, I think those rabbis could learn something from somebody who actually does this work all the time. And I thought it would be interesting for him to see what was happening. We didn't actually know much about what was going on on the ground. We began to learn a little bit, but we came to this really not quite knowing what we were gonna do. But with those, those are actually six bags. He had a bag too of supplies from someone in Portland who bought supplies in Detroit that David had to go and pick up in Detroit and bring with them and take with them to crack out. I don't know, but it's like Zoom. This was out of a desire to help. This was all out of incredible desire to help. These six bags of supplies represented <clears throat> about half of what was donated from our community. There was so much that as many of you know, I had to put out the call quoting from Moses, who told the people, stop bringing stuff. We have enough already. <clears throat> the last time in the history of fundraising that that statement was ever made. And uh, 
we had so many supplies that actually figuring out and packing things into the bags themselves was an endeavor in Tetris that uh, never to be repeated again. But don't worry, all of the supplies that were donated were sent to Poland. We had a local charity um, started by some, a Jewish uh, family in, in Portland, Positive Charge PDX, which is doing all kinds of wonderful good work in town, took all of our excess supplies and shipped them to, to Poland so that everything that was donated uh, went directly to helping refugees. Ultimately in Krakow, I got to unpack the Tetris of these, these uh, uh, the, this incredible packing job uh, that our staff did. Um, and that was really, it was wonderful to be able to see it. And, and I, I hold, for a while I was like, what, why are people doing this? I mean, I understand that people were, were, all of us were feeling what was happening in Ukraine and feeling so strongly um, the, the evils of this war of choice that was foisted upon the Ukrainian people and admiring the courage of these people as they are fighting back against the oppressors. So the fact that people wanted to help, I understood. But why, like, why'd you buy baby formula? I mean, why, like, why was that something? And it, I really realized that when we think about the desire to help and something that is far away and, and, and uh, hard to actually understand, we're seeing it on TV, internet, whatever it might be, there is something about having physically touched the item go into the store and pick something off the shelf and put it into my hands. And knowing that I was going to physically carry it and put it into someone else's hands. So for me, there was holiness in this privilege of carrying these five duffel bags on a Lufthansa flight. I felt our wings were really lifted. There was something that was very powerful about that privilege of carrying all of these many, many, many items that we had. And it was, of course, not just me. Between all of us, we brought, we figure about two tons worth of supplies from around the country and in Israel, and about $750,000 that was given to the Jewish Community Center of Krakow to do the work that they're doing. And I wanna tell you about the work that they're doing. And it means so much to us that our communities, my community, cared so much, wanted to really do something to help these refugees. A little bit of background, I know we've been seeing lots of maps lately. Uh, and this is a part of the world that, of course, many of us, those of us with Ashkenazic Jewish backgrounds, um, have kind of in our, in our hearts. We, we hear it. I mean, uh, you know, Shalom Aleichem was from Ukraine and wrote the stories on which Fiddler on the Roof was created and set probably in Ukraine, in the Russian, uh, in the Pale of Settlement. But um, how exactly we connect into that area um, is, is interesting. We were going to Poland. And as you see here, um, Krakow, down in southern part of Poland. Of course, Warsaw is the city, the largest city in Poland that most people know. Krakow is second largest, and about a three hour ride away from the border to Ukraine. Right here is the city of Lviv that I think many of us have been hearing about, the most Western city in Ukraine where many of the refugees are gathering about an hour or so away from the border. So on our trip, we were 
almost entirely in Krakow, and then a little bit of time, and I'm going to show you some pictures from a town called Przemysl, which is directly on the border and where they're receiving most of these refugees. Um, Krakow, excuse me, Poland, a country of about 38 million people, has over the course of the war when I was there, I don't know what the numbers are today, but a few weeks ago when I was there, had had something along the lines of three and a half million people as refugees from Ukraine, a country of only about 38 million. So an incredible, incredible number of people who have been coming across the border. Krakow itself, a city of about 860,000 people, about the size, say, of Seattle, has on its own absorbed 150,000 refugees since the start of the war. It's hard for us to picture, it's hard for us to imagine the number of people who are coming in. Not all staying in, in Poland, though many of them are. And the thing that I want to bring, and, and I should point out, our purpose for being there was twofold. We rabbis from the United States and from Israel. Our purpose was one, to bring the supplies and the money. And that's something that's important. And as important, or so we were told, was to report back, to do what we're doing today, to let you know what it is that we're seeing. And I've done some interviews and some press and things along those lines, but letting you know exactly what this experience is and knowing what their voice is, is important. So here's a takeaway I want to give you right at the beginning. Again, three and a half million people going through a country of Poland, a country of about 38 million people. There are no refugee camps in Poland. With all of those people streaming through, there are no refugee camps at all. People are brought in, they are met, as I'm gonna show you. They're taken to a place where they can register, where they can, where people can find out what it is that they need, get their resources, maybe it's travel, maybe it's a place to stay, maybe it's food, maybe it's clothing, whatever it is that they need. The Polish people are opening, literally opening their homes. They have refugees living in their homes. They have refugees living in apartments that are being rented for them. They have refugees living in hotel rooms. This has been a national effort, which we see it, saw on a local level. City, country, working together to deal with a refugee crisis they did not create. I wanna hold that in our minds. And overall, what it is that a people can do when they decide they want to do it. NATO closed the sky. So in Krakow, which is a beautiful uh, old city, um, one of the cities of Europe that was not bombed. So you can see old churches, synagogues, etc. I'll show you a little bit, but in the main square, which is the largest, I think the largest square in Europe, um, which was a market square, you've probably seen these in many, either in Krakow or in other European uh, towns, every day there is protest of Ukrainians um, standing there and calling out to NATO to close the sky, to bring arms into Ukraine, but they are there and they're very present. Uh, and uh, and it's not just a matter of refugees coming in, but the Ukrainian people themselves are being very vocal about what this war is all about. Now, I do wanna get a little bit, we did a little bit of history 
while we were there. And the Jewish history of Ukraine of Krakow in particular is quite remarkable. Um, we could do a whole tour of that. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, but I did want to show uh, this very famous synagogue, the Remu synagogue, which was the synagogue of Rabbi Moses Isserlis. Um, you may have heard of a book called the Shulchan Aruch, which is a book of Jewish law. It is the code book of Jewish law. Um, if you really wanna know how is Jewish life supposed to be lived traditionally, the Shulchan Aruch is that book but it was written from a Sephardic perspective, it was written in Israel. The commentary, which made it the most famous book in, uh, in Ju Judaism since the Talmud, was written by Rabbi Moses Israelis, who did the Ashkenazic commentary on Jewish law, um, making him one of the most famous rabbis in, uh, in relatively modern history. This beautiful old synagogue that was his um, is right there. So there's, a, there's this weight of Jewish presence in Krakow. There's also a lot, as in many European cities, a lot of absence. There is, you're probably familiar with in Berlin and throughout Germany, the stumble stones that are signs of this is where a Jewish person lived. In the old city of Krakow, you see these gaps where mezuzahs used to be. And they have plaques that have been set on many of these, these homes to indicate that this was a Jewish home. So that story is told. So it's not on the ground, it's at eye level, but you see the story as you wander through of the Jews uh, who, who left. Um, the story is, is complicated. I don't wanna go into too much uh, here right now, but um, the Holocaust is very, very present for the Jews in Krakow. Um, the, the Jewish community was, was devastated during the Shoah. The Jews who remained, we were told, went through a different experience. We've got the Benikoff family here from Kiev who know this from really personal experience. But under the Soviets, um, who saw themselves as liberators, um, Jewish life was also decimated. And particularly after 1967, we were told that the Six Day War which Russia was a supporter, the Soviet Union was a supporter of the Arab armies uh, when they were defeated so soundly by the Israelis, Jews were forced underground yet again. Um, what we were told was that in Krakow and other places in Poland, in 1989, when the Soviet Union fell, suddenly these families, um, could tell their children that they were Jewish. And this entire generation that grew up not even knowing that they were Jews. So we all are familiar with the story of the conversos happening in you know, 1492. This happened in the 20th century, right under our noses. And you're seeing now this rebirth of a indigenous Jewish community that continued to live in Krakow and in other places in Poland, and a new generation that's discovering what is it to be Jewish. So a really inst interesting institution was founded by, uh, of course, Prince Charles, because why not? Um, Prince Charles was in a visit to Krakow. Um, I forgot what year this, 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 this happened. But we, 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 fight, we, we worked really hard to get the story because what the heck does the Prince Charles have to do with the Jewish Community Center? He uh, was in Krakow, met with Holocaust survivors and asked the question of what do you need? Came, went back to England, met with the Jewish agency. They decided that what was missing in Krakow was a Jewish Community Center that could support these Holocaust survivors that could be a place where they could meet and they could, uh, they, they could, they could re relearn their Jewish experience and it would be a nice thing for you know, a little while until these uh, uh, survivors uh, died out. Um, and so he founded the Jewish Community Center of Krakow. The irony just you know, considering how Jews were treated in England, uh, much less in Poland, uh, you know, the irony goes, uh, goes all over the place, but kind of a remarkable thing. Since the start of the war, 
in Ukraine, the Jewish community center of Krakow turned itself from being a center that had begun taking care of Holocaust survivors, had moved into reinvigorating Jewish life in Krakow and helping these young people who are rediscover or are discovering their Jewish identity for the first time, they immediately turned themselves into a social service agency to deal with Ukrainian refugees. Not Jewish refugees necessarily, but anyone who is in need. This hand-painted sign is the entrance to the Jewish Community Center in Krakow. And the sign reads, yes, how it pronounce it? Welcome to the Ukrainians. Uh, and that's the, for, with the Ukrainian flag outside. And that is what greets these refugees, who by the time they've gotten to Krakow, have been on quite a journey, not only through Ukraine, but into Poland, and then into Krakow, and are finding the place that they need to be. Uh, and they're greeted with a sign in their own language, because Polish is not a well-known language in Ukraine. Uh, and finding their way to a place of welcome at the Jewish Community Center. By the way, um, I, uh, we were instructed not to share on social media photos of the refugees, especially these young women where through uh, a facial identification, they could, be, uh, uh, they could be found and their families back in Ukraine could suffer. I did sneak a few pictures but I didn't share them on social media. So you're actually the first to see those. I didn't really want to, but I wanted to show um, that this is, the, this is the entrance to the Jewish Community Center. And right inside the door is a, they turned one of their, it's not a big place. They turned one of their rooms into a, um, a, a, a store of sorts where people could just pick whatever it is that they need and it's right there and available for them. Uh, and um, you see mostly uh, young women with some children inside. We were brought in to meet with this really amazing uh, Holocaust survivor and hear some of the stories of the Jewish Community Center of Krakow and what they were doing previously. But uh, immediately afterwards, we met with this very, very special young woman. Uh, her name is Nastya. Um, Nasty is, uh, I, I found out through the New York Times that she's 31 years old, I didn't ask her. Uh, the, uh, she is a young woman from a city in Southern Ukraine, not that far from Odessa. Um, and she was uh, preparing with her family to open a, a vegan bakery. Uh, this is someone you would certainly pass on the streets in Portland, Oregon. Um, I was trying to convince her to come here, actually. We need that vegan bakery. Uh, it's bad for we don't have. But, um, you know, we, again, our role wasn't to interview uh, uh, refugees. They're, they had the things that they needed to do. The least we needed was to go in and interfere and try to extract their stories. Nastia um, happens to be working at the Jewish Community Center, um, is a refugee herself, was, uh, and uh, Jonathan Orstein, who's the uh, executive director here, an amazing, amazing person, um, just asked her, you know, I've got a group of rabbis here, would you be willing to talk? She was willing to talk. He had never heard her story. He didn't actually even know himself. She's just a absolutely remarkable person. Uh, she is, her job at the Jewish Community Center, being a refugee herself, having just found an apartment, she was originally put in an apartment that the JCC got for her, and then she figured out how to find an apartment on her own uh, and, uh, and how to work the systems and all those things. And her job at the JCC is to help other refugees and be a kind of guide into Polish life and in getting the resources that, that they need. Um, she told us a little bit about her story, 
having to leave her husband, packing a bag with her five-year-old daughter, um, getting on a bus. She had a day to figure out that the bus was coming and that she was going to be on it, um, packing a bag, not knowing how long it was going to be. Nastia comes from uh, both a Jewish background and an Armenian background. And she, the word she said to us was that this is the third genocide in my family. And this is how they think of it. They view this as a genocide of the Ukrainian people. This is how it feels. And when we hear this story of packing a bag and having to leave and taking your five-year-old daughter, um, the story that comes in our family, and I know in many of your families, was my mother, who was a young girl uh, in a Hungarian town who was invaded by the Nazis and told she had to leave and pack a bag and pack, would, like, what do you know? You don't know what you're leaving. You don't know how long you're going for. You don't know what it is. You don't know what you're supposed to take. Um, and my mother found her, herself on a train to Auschwitz. Um, and that story is being replicated now. Thank God they're not finding their way to Auschwitz. They're finding their way to safety. But how do you imagine for any of us, how do you figure out you're going to take your five-year-old daughter on a bus to a country you've never been to where you know no one and don't speak the language and have no idea if you'll ever be home again? That's what it is to be a refugee. Nastia is the face that I carry with me as I think about these people. Nastia came with us. Uh, a little bit, and I will tell you a, a little bit fast forward to the end of the story. Um, there was a Passover Seder that was celebrated with some of those refugees, and her, as after we left, her parents made it to that Seder, and they're in Poland now. They were actually uh, uh, interviewed in the New York Times, which is why I know how old she is. Uh, the, uh, but uh, her husband is still. In, uh, in Ukraine, the last that I heard. Um, we saw some spaces that were being turned over. So I said that the JCC has turned itself into a social service agency. It is funding many other organizations. It's doing the work that it's doing on its campus, but more importantly, funding other agencies that are on the ground doing the work directly. We went to one of these centers this is a table full of uh, both Polish and Ukrainian people who are a kind of welcome center helping connect people. This is actually, uh, this looks like any startup, uh, right, that, that would exist in, in Portland or anywhere else. It actually is a startup. This was a, um, a, 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 a journalist uh, started this, this space. He was doing some creative journalism. In, uh, in Krakow and turned it into this refugee space. Uh, this is actually a theater space that they're in, that they're using. So they're actually directly housing some of the refugees and they're also uh, helping to make, give people connections from other places. One of the very interesting things we learned in this space was that um, some of the Roma who are refugees uh, are coming to Krakow as well and no one wants to help them. And in fact, the Ukrainian refugees don't want to be roomed with the Roma as well. So it's complicated. These things are, these things are complicated. You see all around signs of support for Ukrainians uh, throughout, throughout Krakow. Um, and the, here in English, you can have it, but there's signs in lots of different languages. You see the colors of the Ukrainian flag all around. It is really a part of life. What you don't see is people begging on the street. What you don't see is people sleeping on the street. When you drive around Krakow, it looks like Krakow. You wouldn't know that you were in the middle of a refugee crisis if you didn't already know. That's another piece that I think is important for us to see. 
we had the, the worst accommodations possible and had to travel with such great difficulty all the time. Took this nice little bus um, from Krakow uh, to this border town of Shemesh. And I want to get you to this border town. We went first went to the town hall in Bashemish, this like very ornate kind of crazy place. We were treated like some kind of strange royalty. But the important thing that was there that we learned, this town, by the way, uh, the Shemesh was a city that was one quarter Jewish before the war. There are no Jews left. They have a museum. Um, but that's an interesting, an interesting part of it. But they talked to us about how the town has dedicated resources towards resettlement, towards helping the refugees. This is uh, a part of the story that we heard wherever we were, that, that uh, uh, government and private groups and corporations and NGOs all working together to find the resources that are needed for the Ukrainians. Happened to run into this very handsome young man, uh, my son David, um, outside uh, a, in, this, in this town of Chemish near the border uh, at the humanitarian aid center um, where we gathered to kind of get an idea of what was happening. The other thing that we saw in all of these aid centers was Israel and the Jewish agency is everywhere. Um, that is one of the things that is, well, there are many, many NGOs um, and there are many groups that are helping. But one of the pieces is that Israel, which, you know, as we know, governmentally has, uh, has not, has tried to stay neutral in all of this, that's problematic. But the Israeli people are on the ground. They, we, we, met, we met a lot of Israelis. And then of course, it's the whole Jewish thing. of I know you, you grew up with my brother. It was a lot of Jewish geography that happened on this trip, which was really pretty crazy. Um, and I, I did, I knew there was one, one quick story I wanted to tell when I was talking about Nastia and coming into, uh, into the JCC with her five-year-old daughter. One of the first things she told us that bringing her daughter there the first time they had a Shabbat dinner. And she said it was the first time that she heard her daughter laughing and singing throughout this entire journey. And to be able to celebrate Shabbat in a safe place was really, really meaningful. And throughout, you see the children, you see the, um, the things that children make. They're, they're doing activities for the kids while the parents are going through the program. Their resources, the children, there are activities that are there for the children. Um, and there are places to stay. So there is this room in this particular humanitarian center. They could see 800, they could, they could sleep 800 people in that room. There was no one sleeping there uh, at the time. They, they had people staying, but if anybody who was staying there was staying overnight, two, three days max. And then they were being placed somewhere else and having a home that they could actually be in. Unbelievable amount of resources like what we brought. Uh, corporations are sending things, NGOs are bringing things. And when you see, you know, the baby strollers. I mean, there's certain things that just kind of get you when you see it. I'm just seeing these stacks of baby strollers. Um, some of the kids being kids and, and playing. We went to the border, um, which was close by. I, I couldn't get a good picture of this, but the, the picture, I wanted you, this picture because this shows that there were no, uh, there are no trucks coming across the border from Ukraine into Poland and all going into Ukraine from Poland. So people are coming into Poland, goods and supplies going into Ukraine. That's the, that's the, the experience that's happening right now. The border itself um, looks like a festival. Um, it is it is really a place of celebration. At, I mean, this is Waterfront Park, right? I mean, it, it, it is filled with all of these different uh, tents, flags flying, the Polish and the Ukrainian flag flying over there, um, and all of these different groups that are basically saying, when a, when a refugee comes, let, come, please, let me help you. Let me find something for you. Let me welcome you. Um, at the time that we were there, there actually weren't uh, it just happened to be a kind of a, a, a quiet time. There weren't many refugees coming in. 
Um, and, uh, and in fact, um, there were more refugees going back. Many of these people, many of these young women um, are not staying. They want to get back to their families uh, in Ukraine. Um, and it's a little bit difficult because when they leave, they leave their refugee status and they can't regain it. So to make the decision to go back to Ukraine is a big one. And we saw a number of these people. In fact, we saw one family coming across and uh, because there weren't that many people coming, like all of these, all these people kind of rushed over to her. <laughs> you can imagine how uh, kind of overwhelming it was. Like all these people, what do you want? What do you want from me? They want, want to help carry your suitcases. No, I can carry it. But they, but people are there and they want to help. I want to contrast that to the experience that I had on the Texas-Mexico border just a few years ago, where it's all razor wire and military personnel and how dare you remain, come into our country, remain in Mexico and we'll talk. And when your lottery number comes up, maybe you can come in and have an interview. It is diametrically opposed in Poland. It is, how can I help you? What can I do for you? What is it that you need? Not, here's what I have to give you, but tell me what you need and I'll get it for you. You need transportation, I'll get you there. You need um, to make a phone call. Um, I took pictures of the English signs, but you get it, it's in Ukrainian as well. Uh, you now have a phone call that you need to make. We're right here. Make your phone call right here. Okay. Not, we're going to give you a, a ticket that you can turn in to another place and you can. It's how can I help you? That's what's going on in Poland right now. We had an experience at the, at, the, uh, at the border, went to a nice hotel, and we had a Passover Seder, pre-Passover Seder, with a number of the, uh, of the workers, the, refu the, 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 the NGOs and other people who were providing these, these who were working day and night, helping uh, the refugees and uh, a bunch of rabbis together on what can you do. And um, for reasons that I do not understand, some of the, uh, the Polish uh, workers, NGOs there decided to dress up as Cossacks, which the Jews were kind of, the, I appreciate the gesture, but the, I, the, I, it was not the Passover that I was thinking of. But they were lovely, lovely people. And some of the Israeli rabbis led, uh, led the service as well, along with some of the Americans. Uh, it was actually a, a really amazing experience. I wanna get to, this is the part that I really wanna get to the most. We spent a lot of time, we, we, spent, we were there for four days. Um, but here, back in Krakow, this is the piece that I want to leave you uh, remembering. Um, we were taken to a uh, shopping center. Mazel tov. You know, you're going to go to a shopping mall. But like many shopping malls around the world right now, um, after COVID, this place had shut down and it was abandoned and the owners were whatever and being sold to whoever and all it's an empty shopping mall. It had been turned into a center for giving uh, humanitarian aid. Not out in the country somewhere, not far away from the population, not somewhere where we don't see them. It's at a shopping mall, it's in the middle of town, it's right by the major entertainment center uh, in Krakow. Uh, and you see these signs of here is that we are providing humanitarian aid. So here is what humanitarian aid distribution looks like in this center. The clothes are beautifully arranged on racks. The walls are filled with shoes sorted by sizes. There is a lovely little play space for the children so that the moms can go and find the clothes that they're looking for, find toys for their kids, 
search through bins for whatever they might be needing. The only thing that's absent in this space are cash registers. Whatever it is that they need, they try on, they make sure it fits, they make sure it's what they need, what they're looking for. They leave with the goods and supplies that they need, and they leave with their dignity. My friends, this is how humanitarian aid should be distributed. It's not, look how wonderful I am that I have these things for you, but tell me what you need. Or more importantly, go find what you need. We're gonna put it out for you. You take what you need and leave with your dignity intact. There were so many workers who were there from all over the world. This woman I met from Colorado, who's working with a Nor Norwegian uh, NGO. Why? She liked it, said something. She traveled across the world to stand there and sort dresses for children. There's so many supplies that are coming in from corporations, from NGOs, from people like us that are coming and being distributed directly. And these workers and all of this, all this stuff is in the back. The refugees themselves don't see any of this. They see a store, just like the stores back home. That's all they see. All of this is back behind what we're doing. And you know, the work of sorting through and making sure that things are there and making sure that they're in good shape and giving them to other people. And I just, I love this. They left over some stuff from the Galleria Mall it's like the flyers for the mall are still there. Um, but, you know, I, I don't know if I was receiving aid and I was walking out and seeing a flyer that looked like welcome to the shopping center. That would kind of make me feel good. I'd feel a little bit normalized. Um, and I think there's, uh, there's a, that, that's something that's really important, too. There are other things you see around town. Uh, I, I don't... I don't know what that means, but, but I, it's, it's something. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, but uh, I will, uh, and, and uh, we, we were also treated with a lot of uh, respect by the city of Krakow. Uh, and of course, you know, the hero um, who is really beautifully recognized in, uh, in, in Krakow uh, as well. I'll tell you one other piece um, as we get cl close to the conclusion. I asked Nastia um, in the group, I said, you know, in America, we're watching this war and in America, we're very careful to call this Putin's war. We're very careful to say that this is about Putin and not the Russian people. And I'll tell you, there was anger in her eyes. There was hatred in her eyes. For her, it's not Putin, it's the Russians. She sees this, and I think it's shared by many Ukrainian refugees, and we should know this, that it is the Russian people and not just Putin himself. That this is a war that was imposed on them. We know that the Russian people, right now it's criminal to uh, to tell the truth about what this war is inside of Russia. There's a complete control over the media. So can we really say that the Russian people are supporting the war when they don't quite know what it is? I don't know. The politics of this are hard. But the humanity of this is hard. As we were doing some planning for this upcoming event uh, on the 17th, there are some religious leaders who really wanted to talk about this as you know, we're saying no to war and we're not taking sides and we and, and it's war is terrible for everyone. And I understand that. And for the Ukrainian people that I met, and maybe you can tell me differently, um, that's not a position that's shared or appreciated. The Ukrainian people are suffering horrifically. They are suffering in ways that we as Jews understand because we were there 
Now, many people say there's a great irony because let's be honest, Poland was not a great friend to the Jews during World War II. Frankly, neither was Ukraine. And the statement that was said by Jonathan Ornstein, the director, executive director of the Jewish Community Center in Krakow, his statement is because they didn't stand for us, we have to stand for them. That's what it means to be a Jew. We are standing up now and we are recognizing that there is incredible suffering that's going on and that we have the ability and therefore the responsibility to do something. I asked Nastia, what message do you want me to bring back to my community in Portland, Oregon? And the message was thank you. She said, now we know that someone cares. Now we know that we are not alone. And I think that's the message we wanna really hold on to. There are global issues going on. There are governments and NGOs involved. But in the end, it's people. It's people trying to make their way in an impossible world, in a place where they were living that was like Portland, Oregon, living a life like we might understand, and suddenly having their homes destroyed by missiles from afar, suddenly seeing tanks rolling into their home, into their home cities something we thought we'd left behind with World War II. And yet we know one of the reasons we are all paying attention to this. There are two reasons. One is that this is the first wired world war. We're seeing it happening live on our phones. We're seeing it happening. Uh, uh, my, my, my son, we were talking about the news and how he gets his news. He said he, he gets all of his news from TikTok. You know, but it's from Ukrainian people who are uploading videos off of their phones. And, and it, it, it is live. It is uncensored. It's happening right in front of us. That, of course, breaks our heart because we, we can't pretend that we don't see. And let's face it, these lovely people like Nastia look like us, like most of us in this room. We can relate, we can see ourselves in their stories, and we have to remember that refugees come in all shapes, all colors, all types, all nationalities. We are seeing this scourge of war and destruction, not just in Ukraine. It's happening in South America, it's happening all over the world. And people are fleeing for their lives and packing, maybe they don't even get a suitcase to pack and fleeing with their children. And they're being met on our borders and in borders in Europe and many places in the world with razor wire and military and a strong statement, we don't want you here. And if we learn anything from this experience of Poland, if we learn anything from the Polish people, it's not that hard. It's not impossible when you're dedicated when you decide it's a crisis, you can move mountains. And you can move mountains while retaining the dignity of the people that you're helping. It's not that hard. It's not impossible. I was privileged to be among a group of people who could say, Hineni, here I am. We are standing here with you. I hope that when we're all called, 
that we can all say Hineni, not only for the Ukrainian refugees, but for refugees, immigrants, others who are stateless, homeless, suffering in dignities we can't imagine. Let's all say Hineni. Thank you, we've kept you a long time. I'm happy to take any questions if you'd like. And if you need to leave, I wish you a Shabbat Shalom as well. But if there's any questions, I'm happy to take them. That was a very fast four days of my life. Absolutely right, yeah, yeah. Thank you, all right, yes.